<laughs> good? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. This is going to work fine. Sure, yeah. Everybody's so and, and Are we you know, supposed to pick up the mic? Uh, no, because you were already mic Oh, that's good. And um, that's just during your Q&A if you need a ticket. Oh, like sure, it. okay. So, Great. Yeah. And so, yeah, Excellent. we'll start. And just, I'm, you, All right. I'll let you know when it's time to start. But, okay. But um, Hank is going to talk first. Yeah. And then um, he'll do a brief introduction of me, and I'll read one poem, then I'll introduce you guys. Okay. And then when I say, you know, Peter Mikey is reading first. Okay. So we'll read your two poems. I'll read it, and I'll give it to Bob. Exactly. Yeah. Sound good? All right. That sounds Don't great. Do <laughs> <laughs> oh. I have to come here to see my neighbor. Yeah, close. there it is. We never meet over there. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's good. So I'll read two poems first, and then, and then I give it to Bob. Take it. Mm -hmm. All right. So he will read his, oh, and I then see. he'll give it back to you. Yep. And you'll read hers. It'll go great. Right. And we're here. It will be easy. Perfect. It's a friendly audience. Yeah. <laughs> you look great. Oh, you look great too, my dear. It's a. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you came back. I didn't want to sit up here alone. Oh, I just had to. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. We have an unusually unruly crowd tonight, but <laughs> probably writers, could be painters, they're all the same. We are very happy to have you here tonight, and we are very appreciative that you would come to our series of Poetry at the Dali, curated by Helen Pruitt Wallace. Uh, we're so happy. We're so happy to be back live. Uh, I know that we have developed an audience online, and so we welcome you who are listening remotely as well. Uh, I'm Hank Hine, I'm the museum director, and we're very proud of this program in poetry. And you can see I'm sort of stalling while people come in from the bar. <laughs> you know, in some poetry readings, they close the bar, and, and it's the best way of getting attendance. Uh, um, like again, bar. an unruly kind of crowd. Um, 
On stage tonight are not only uh, are two gentlemen who are not only uh, deeply, deeply loved in this community, uh, but respected in the same measure. Um, we have the Poet Laureate of Florida, Peter Mankey. <laughs> And we have Bob Devin Jones. The, the Dean of the Arts in St. Petersburg. These gentlemen have made an incredible mark, not only on the literary scene, but, and not only on the broader cultural scene, but in terms of the joy and spirit of possibility in St. Petersburg. They have been an amazing force. I know that you feel deeply uh, love for each of them as I do. And uh, I just feel so proud to welcome them to our stage. Uh, we will keep one of our uh, habits in this uh, series of Poetry at the Dali, in which we insist that Helen Pruitt Wallace begin the proceedings <laughs> by reading a poem. So please welcome Helen Pruitt Wallace. Right. Thank you, everybody. It's so nice to see you guys here. Um, some of you were probably here last month, and I couldn't be. Um, Gloria Monez took over as our host, and she was awesome. I did get to watch it um, online, so that was fun. Um, to be able to do that. But anyway, it's really, really nice um, to see all of your faces. And we appreciate your being here. And gosh, this is so overdue to have Peter Mikey and Bob Devin Jones together on the stage. So we're just really thrilled. <laughs> I also want to, um, to say that, you know, Hank is so modest. I mean, he's an amazing director for this museum. And he's, you know, always looking out for what else to do here, um, how, to, how to stay true to who we are, but also how to adapt and change and, and draw in new audiences. And what he doesn't always tell you is that he's a poet also. And if you've come to this program, I mention it often because he's a very fine poet. And I always enjoy his words as well, but he adds so much to our program and um, we're very grateful for your support and the support of the whole museum. We're going on our ninth year, which is just crazy. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but tonight is a special night. I also want to do um, a shout out to Gretchen Mikey. This is Peter's daughter who is with us. We're so happy to have you. And I see a lot of writers um, in the audience, and um, you guys add so much, and especially your, you know, the Q&A at the end, be thinking of your questions for these two guys. Um, but thank you all for coming. We know you, especially in St. Pete, you've got all kinds of ways to, um, to spend your time in the arts. I see Mo McDole back there, Maureen, who has a lot to do with all those things happening here in the arts. And thank you, Maureen. So, yeah. Okay, I, I will read um, a short poem. And then I will introduce our guests. We're going to do it a little bit differently tonight. Instead of having one poet at a time read, they're going to read kind of back and forth. Um, so we thought we'd just kind of mix it up a little bit. So um, this is a poem that uh, has shifted. I think I had an earlier draft. I don't know that I read it here. But um, I, think, I think the most recent um, redrafting has gone darker, no, no doubt, because of all the hard events that are happening in the world. But I don't know. Maybe you'll hear that. Maybe you won't. It's called Unknowing End of Summer. It's early fall. The hummingbirds have fled. Their feeders left behind like vials of blood for the living or the dying who don't know it yet. Already the maples shudder. They're letting go both from and toward a buried seed, such red eruptions. And a wren's nest sags from the rafters where still a bird worries the tangled toupee, as if this spring the eggs won't crack and fall. They do again, and yet the birds come back, 
their brittle legs clutching the soft tufts of dead grass as if, as if each blade matters, as if just one could keep a world aloft. <laughs> come on in. Thank you. Yeah. And if more people come in, um, urge them to come down and sit in the front, too, if they can be down here with us, too. Um, I'm going to introduce Peter Meinke first. Um, at age 90, uh, Peter Meinke, would you ever believe it? I mean, just no, no way. <laughs> at age 90, Peter Meinke never expected to still be reading poetry to an audience. Professor Emeritus at Eckerd College, he became the first Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg in 2009, and later Poet Laureate of Florida in 2015. And, you know, he's so terrific at it, we can't even find anybody to follow him. You know? so, <laughs> for which we're, we're happy he's still there. In 2020, he received the Florida Humanities Lifetime Literary Award for writing. He's published 16 books of poems, eight in the prestigious Pitt Poetry Series, which is amazing, um, three collections of short stories, also award-winning books, um, and several collections of essays. His late wife, the amazing um, Jeannie Clark Meinke, whom I know so many of you um, knew and loved, um, she illustrated many of his books, including his most recent book of poems, which is called Tasting Like Gravity, and came out in 2018. So happy to have you here, Peter. And Peter was pivotal to um, my wanting to go deeper and more into poetry. I audited his class when I was, um, well, the second class I audited, I was pregnant with our first child, <laughs> and he still let me in. Um, and he's just been an enormous influence on, on me and my work. But um, not only because of his focus on craft, but he's just um, such an amazing person. So welcome, Peter. Um, next, we have Bob Devin Jones, and we're so happy to have Bob. <laughs> Bob Devin Jones is a native of Los Angeles, and he began his theatrical career as an actor performing in Shakespeare festivals, um, including Oregon, Berkeley, Illinois, Idaho, and eventually in St. Pete, at the American Stage of Shakespeare in the Park, and we are so lucky that you did. <laughs> so, um, he's a graduate of Loyola Marymount University, and he attended the American Conservatory in San Francisco, as well as a one-year tutorial uh, with instructors from the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and the London Academy of Dramatic Art in London, England. For the past 30 years, he's worked with the theater primarily as a playwright and a director. So He has been a resident of St. Pete since 97, participating in many educational and cultural organizations. These include Academy Prep, Pinellas County Cultural Affairs Task Force, and the, Humanities, um, the Florida Humanities Council. He currently serves on the board of Pinellas Diaspora Arts Project and sits on the Public Arts Com uh, Commission for the city of St. Pete. <clears throat> Bob is a recipient of numerous awards and grants including the Bank of America's Hero Award, Weekly Planet's Best of the Bay for Directing and Playwright, and the Tampa Bay Lightning Community Hero in 2018. Wow. Um, the Tampa Bay Business Impact Award and was awarded the key to the city of the St. Petersburg by then Mayor um, Rick Kreisman. He's currently a contributing writer for the Artisan Magazine, and many of you all I know know him for his tireless work um, and the endless joy he gives us all from what he does at um, Studio 620. So welcome, Bob. <laughs> okay, we're going to start off, um, and Peter will read two poems, and then pass it to Bob. You will you sit right oh. there and read them. Oh, I can read right here. You can read right here. Oh, good, no yes. need to get up. So. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. It's a special pleasure for me today to be reading with my neighbor and friend, <laughs> Bob Devin Jones. It's, so it's terrific. Um, two poems? Yes, and then, and then you can pass it to me. I shall do we'll that. Go back and so I thought I'd start, since we're here, with a poem about here called Walking by the Dali Museum. <laughs> <laughs> the clouds on the rain-slick sidewalk moving faster than I, 
and once in a while a bird beneath my feet, a feeling of speed and light. My heels grow wings, I'm dancing on the sky above the mailbox hydrants, trees, three smokestacks belching at my toes. So what? My toes grow wings. My knees grow wings, my ears, my nose, my belly, and yes, my wings grow wings. I feel like Gulliver, bolstered by a flutter of butterflies above the storm. I feel free. I feel free. And now the butterflies start growing heels. The heels are growing noses. This trip is growing complicated. That's, <laughs> that's how I know it's real. <laughs> Second one, I don't know if you use this anymore. I still have bottles of liquid paper, which is how I correct all the mistakes I make in, I make in uh, typing. And I like the name liquid paper. It's sort of an oxymoron, liquid and paper yanked together. So uh, that's the title of this poem, Liquid Paper. Smooth as a snail, this little parson pardons our sins. Touch the brush tip lightly and abracadabra, a clean slate. We know those who blot their brains by sniffing it, which shows it erases more than ink. And with <laughs> imagination, anything can be misapplied. In the army, our top sergeant drank aftershave, squeezing my old spice to the last slow drop. It worked like liquid paper in his head <laughs> until he'd glide across the streets of Heidelberg hunting for the house in Boise, Idaho where he was born. If I were God, I'd authorize celestial liquid paper every seven years to whiten our mistakes. We should be sorry and live with what we've done, but Seven years is long enough, and all of us deserve a visit now and then to the house where we were born before everything got written so far wrong. This poem doesn't have a title, but inherent in who's it about, you'll know what it's about. One of Peter Meinke's most well-known poems is Advice to My Son. Advice, hmm. Advice most often means adds wisdom. I'm certain that is why we have laureates, scribes, griots, elders, and that is what Peter is a dignified elder who adds wisdom. I suspect dignity is not something we can actually confer on Peter, rather the person Peter is. He has it, dignity. Peter has it. He enters the room with it. I suspect he came into the world with a very specific purpose, to lodge himself underneath the life we imagine and to stand under and understand the lives we ultimately achieve. Not so much wearing a cape or the robes of the academy, rather the soles of the soles like diamonds on the soles of his shoes and the quality of his listening to that which makes us human, makes us vulnerable, complicated, accomplished in all sorts of calamity, standing, standing relentlessly on our knees in the middle of the river and asking, seeking, pleading with the universe, please reveal the who of am I. You see, a scribe like Peter is listening. It's rather nice. So when Peter enters the room, master degree, PhD, emeritus, laureate, dignified elder, 
we are persuaded by his listening to us to what it means to be human. And he adds wisdom. You know, so for many several years on any ordinary morning, some several days of the week, I had the pleasure of seeing Peter and his lovely wife, Jeannie, walking by Tampa Bay, walking along Lassing Park in the old southeast. It often reminded me if I desired to sit in my favorite chair and if I had forgotten, forgotten which chair that was or to be at table not remembering how to gratify my hunger, I would and could remember Peter adds wisdom. Not advice, but wisdom. I don't know if I can read after hearing that. Or but <laughs> I feel very, very moved. Thank you. Everything fingers. This poem is called Zinc Fingers. Though scientists inform us that criminals have insufficient zinc, I've always believed it's insufficient gold and silver that gets them going. <laughs> the man who slipped his hand into my front pocket on the jammed Paris metro wasn't trying to make friends. His overcoat smelled greasy, and it was unpleasant holding hands above my wallet, pressed in on all sides like stacked baguettes. There was no way to move or take a swing. Still, some action on my part seemed to be called for. We stood nose to nose. I tried to look in his eyes, but he stared at my chin, shy on our first date. So after a while, as we rattled along toward the Champs-Élysées, I lost concentration and began to think of our scholarly daughter working at Yale on a project called Zinc Fingers, scanning a protein with pseudopods, each with a trace of zinc that latch onto our DNA and help determine what we become. This brought me back to Mon Ami, the pickpocket. <laughs> I wondered how he chose his hard line of work, and if as a boy he was good at cards, for example, or sewing. And for that matter, what choice did I have either? So when we reached our stop and he looked up from my chin at last, I smiled at him and his eyes flashed in fear or surprise. And I called, it's OK, as he scuttled away. Tout va bien, though I held tight to my wallet. <laughs> and my daughter here who gave me all the zinc fingers information and <laughs> somewhere in the dark where I can't see Gretchen. Lucky Bones. He's a sight, the old athlete bent at 78, hopping crow-like to pick a ball on the short bounce, dropping it dead over the net in open court. Great shot, his partner shouts, but he can't hear. Instead, his bird neck swivels toward his wife, who used to toss car keys that flashed through light like lucky bones, crying, hey, big fella, think fast. And he thinks, that's just the past in my head, like a red-eyed crow. And he's thinking, Christ, he could still catch them if she was still there to throw. Oh. 
I was, this is a rather old poem, and I was asked to write a poem about a chocolatier. Do you know what that is? Okay. I couldn't leave well enough alone, so I skewed it just a little bit. <laughs> Sweetsville. There was in the not too distant past, in the verdant hills of the little hamlet of Sweetsville, Sweetsville, Alabama, an incomprehensible fear of a chocolate planet. You see, the gentle folk who currently inhabited Sweetsville had never, in fact, seen or even eaten a piece of chocolate. But somehow, they had been convinced, inculcated with the idea, either through folktale, oral history, or perhaps the liberal media, that if ever they were in the very presence of the rich ebony morsels, within sniffing distance, say, they would be gripped by an uncontrollable desire, lust, if you will, to consume to the point of intoxication all the chocolate they could get their hands on. During the greedy days of the Civil War, all of the chocolate was rounded up and lodged at the rear end of the rainbows. And with that, the folk who used to dwell in Sweetsville simply refused to ever look up ever again. Never to acknowledge the presence or the persistence of rainbows ever, ever, ever again. How sad. Then on some recent and ordinary Tuesday, there appeared a disturbance in the sky. The sound was compelling, seductive, hurt, bruised even. You just couldn't resist it, sort of like jazz. So the inhabitants of Sweetsville looked up, reluctantly at first. They looked up and towards the heavens where their eyes bumped into the sound and the rainbows that had been just hanging around up there for some hundred years, just hanging around. All the people of Sweetsville began running, running in the same direction toward the sound that appeared to be coming from the end of the rainbows. And when the people got there to the end of the rainbows, after not so much effort really, what did they find? What did they see? A chocolate tear, a single chocolatier for all they had forgotten, for all that they had suddenly, sadly remembered. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we we're all waiting for more chocolate. <laughs> A nice poem. <clears throat> I just read this. Scars. When I was young, I longed for scars like my father's. They were the best scars on the block. Startling, varied, pink as a tongue against his whiskey skin. The longest bolted from his elbow, finger thick, where the barbed wire plunged in, a satin rip thinning toward the wrist. I read the riddle of my father's body like a legend punctuated by pale hyphens, neat commas, surgical asterisks, and exclamation points from scalp to ankle. His tragic knuckles spoke violence in demotic Greek. My silent father said little, too little it seems, but after the divorce he told me, tracing the curved path on his skull where hair never grew, it's the one you can't see that can kill you. And it's true, our doctor said, his liver which did him in was scarred like an old war horse. Still, the mark I knew best, I gave him myself, hitting a pop fly straight up and swinging the child's bat again with all my might as the ball descended over the plate. 
he had run into catcher. And the bat cracked him under his chin, dropping my father like a murdered king, peeling a wound no butterfly bandage could cover. I was too stunned to move. But the look my mother gave me proved, no matter what happened later, this man, bleeding like Laius on the ground, was the one she loved. Okay, read this, okay? So I'm going to read two. And this was from, you know, sometimes, if you're old enough to remember, uh, they used to do this. You may already be a winner. Or, uh, <laughs> so I get a phone call several years back from Hank Hines saying, we'd like you to do something at the Dali. Are you game? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I came up with this choreo poem about somebody they were wanting to do an exhibition on. And my big contribution was this choreo poem called Until the River Never Grieves, a poem of sorts for Ami Cesar. And I'm just going to read you one section of it. Every poet may become a playwright, but not every playwright can become a poet. You see, the poet masters the inscrutable nuance of language, one word at a time. In a Promethean effort to illuminate the evidence, the evidence of things not yet tasted, poet uses the grace of his wit with the unrelenting clarity of a shimmering steel scalpel, with the economy of just one word, with an emphatic empathy. Poet jars the floor by giving word vox, negritude, rhythm, life itself. Somewhere far below the level of his sex, poet cease not to prosplain, rather to navigate his place of origin, not from the ignorant present, but with the atavistic fury of ancestors. The hurt, dirt of Africa holds the memory and the bones of all humankind. This archaeology is heady work if you can get it. He, Ami Cesar, got it. Like a bent calypso clock torqued in the middle, beseeching the heavens to embrace the shadow, the darker brother, and shadow the embrace. Every one of us has been a witness to what happened next. So we created, imagined, a legba. The African trickster works like a shaman, a dancing midwife, a poet to sift through the detritus as burning house becomes ashes and all the wailing souls become dust beyond pain. The ground weeps. The earth is scorched. Poet scatters the tears mingled with this specific history, this epic displacement of African people perforce made the gods leave Africa too. They scattered these shadows to the Americas, the Europe's, the Caribbean's, Australia, and the shores of Asia. <laughs> and the final thing I'm gonna read And I'm only going to read an excerpt of it. The first play that I wrote, full play, on my own, was called Uncle Ben's A Home-Cooked Negro Narrative. And it was based on these, you know, these negrobilious figurines that somehow needed to be rescued and reimagined. And the first piece I wrote was a piece about a, a train person, which my granddaddy, Flanol, was. And, um, but that's not the piece I'm reading. I'm reading a piece on um, Horace. He believed he could fly.
I often had the feeling from a very early age, around five or six, that well, I would die young. Perhaps I had this sensation even before then. This may account for my reluctance to come into the world. My mother nearly died after 78 hours of labor. A vivid recollection of resistance, of wishing to be forestalled my early death by a way of a tardy entrance into this life. By the time I was in my teens, I was convinced of my fate, that I would die young. It was during this time I started keeping dirt in my right front trousers pocket. This was my quiet preparation for the grave. I spent most of my teens with my hands shoved in my front pants pocket, fastened around that dirt. Sometimes I would transfer the dirt from my trouser pocket to my bed sock. I would go to sleep with that sock. If I, got, if I forgot to do this, Mimi, my grandmother, would remove the dirt for me and place it in a little burlap hanky she had fashioned from a coon sack when she had used when she was with her five sisters picking cotton in Ball Knob, West Virginia. I had taken this dirt from the colored cemetery on Baby Road in Lake Providence at the funeral of Squire Dix. Just before Pastor nodded for the pallbearers to lay Squire in, I scooped me up a big handful of that damp soil and quickly housed it in my pocket. The mean, sultry month of August was the month Squire died, when the weather is angry and hot, and near about everybody in Louisiana is hot and angry, and the rest of the folks is just plain hot. That dirt was to be my insurance that if or as I truly knew when I died early, I would not have, however, have that startled, surprised expression on my face like Squire Dix. <laughs> <laughs> with, that soul in my, with that soil in my pocket, I'd have the jump on old man ashes to ashes and his cousin dust to dust. I was fairly certain Pastor Bates would intone these words at my barrel just as he was about to do over Squire. It had not been determined what or who had scared Squire, Square, scared him half to death, straight to death. Whatever it was, he didn't see it coming till it was too late. Digger Odell, the undertaker, had not been able to make Squire's eyes shut close, and Squire's mama, Shirley Mae Cooksey, only allowed the casket to be opened at the view of the remains at the grave site, where most of the little ones would not be in attendance lest they get startled or frightened by Squire's clown-eyed expression. <laughs> One last paragraph. Anyway, by that time, I reached the downhill side of my 20s. I was convinced I would make, make it past 33, like Jesus. So on the day after my 32nd birthday, along the banks of the Pearl River, I took the dirt out of my pocket late one Sunday morning. It was little more than a teaspoon now. I clutched the dirt in my right hand, brought a fisherman's knife slowly out of my back pocket, and I said a quick prayer. Jesus wept. The knife caught on the belt loop of my trouser and skipped out of my hand. Damn, damn. It fell into the river and nicked the head of a catfish, which tried to bite me as I sitted through my hands, the legs, when I waited into water to get the knife back. The knife was cool and wet against the palm of my dry white hand. There was a tiny drop of blood at the tip where it had pierced the flesh of the fish. I placed the tip along the right end of my upturned palm and slowly traced the crease of my existing lifeline, which stopped one and one half inches north of the bend of my wrist. Um, we're all very happy Bob is still with us. So. <laughs> I, was, I was worried as he was moving through. Um, this is a, a sonnet called The Poet Trying to Surprise His God. The poet trying to surprise his God composed new forms from secret harmonies, tore from his fiery vision galaxies of unrelated shapes, both even and odd. But God just smiled and gave his know-all nod, saying, there's no surprising one who sees the acorn root and branch of centuries. I swallow all things up like Aaron's rod, 
So hold this thought beneath your poet bonnet. No matter how pre-seeming flows your sample, God is by definition the unsurprised. Then I'll return the poet side to sonnets of which this is a rather pale example. Is that right, said God? I hadn't realized. <laughs> Thank you. What terrific readings. Thank you both so much for um, you. letting us hear your words. <laughs> and we're going to segue now into our Q&A, uh, which you guys are all familiar with. So um, any questions that you have for, for Bob and for Peter, um, please just, uh, Kim is here and she's got a mic in the back. Thank you, Kim. Um, just raise your hand so that we can make sure that we hear you. And um, let's have a conversation. So, who wants to start us out? Peter and Bob. Okay, we'll bring in you. okay here you come. Yeah. <laughs> How did y'all first meet? What was that moment like? I didn't hear it. Um, yeah, hang on, just to say, she'll just kind of, how, how did you all first meet? The two of you. Oh, yeah. Bob and I. Well, we're neighbors. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we probably met walking when we went out to see the bay, which is right between our houses, sort of. But it was years ago. A long, long time ago on the south side of St. Pete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other follow-up questions about the two of them? I have what I wanted to start with. Um, I'm interested, since you both write in different forms, um, you know, playwright, both fiction and poetry for you. Bob, I'm sure you've written some fiction as well as poems. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process? What are some things that, despite your genre, um, stay the same and how you get the piece of writing going? Or how are some things different, depending on the genre in which you're exploring? Can you both talk a little bit about that, your writing process, really? Well, usually, if I think of anything that sounds interesting, usually it's just a sentence or some words or something I hear, I'll put it down in a notebook, this sort of thing. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't, in some ways, it's good that I don't plan, like I don't sit down, well, today I'm going to write a poem. I think I'll make it a sonnet. <laughs> right. It never happens that way. Mm -hmm. uh, if I feel, sometimes I've, I've heard something that sounds interesting, I'll write the line down and I, write another line and it, I see which way it's going. I, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's often true that if the writer doesn't surprise himself, he won't surprise mm -hmm. the reader either. So it, it takes that, I think it's good that when I, I think at least for me, when I sit down, I really don't know where I'm going. <laughs> I just start, I usually have a couple of phrases that I've heard that I like. And, I'll put them down, and sometimes, maybe even most times, nothing much happens. But occasionally, that suggests another line, and that suggests, and if once I get a few lines down, they seem to want to go somewhere, mm -hmm. and I let them tell me where they want to go. Mm -hmm. So as a follow-up for that, um, do you typically sit down knowing which genre you're going to be writing in, uh, Peter? Do you sit down at least and know this is likely to be a poem as opposed to this is likely to be a short story? Um, or do you even wait for that to kind of emerge in the writing process? Yeah, uh, yeah. do you typically know when you first sit down if it's gonna I, be a poem you're working on? I think, on? right, the very first minute, I don't think I know, but once I have a line, I know, I seem to know in my head that this is a prose line, the beginning of a story, okay. it suggests some other things that don't rhyme or have no rhythm and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll follow it to a story. Uh -huh. And uh, if it's a line of a poem, I'll recognize it. Okay. <laughs> Usually, and I'll okay. try to. I don't always finish either. I start things. I start a lot more things than I finish, but mm -hmm. I try to do something a little bit every day, more or less. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Bob, how about you? Well, the most recent iteration of whatever my process is, um, you called us while we were in Amsterdam mm -hmm. to be on stage with Peter. And, do the poetry at the Dali, and I was, you know, and so of course I said, I, I got to start reading again, and I have several books of Peter's, but I came to the poem, which I knew of uh, already, uh, advice to my son, mm 
And, you know, if you were standing in a river on your knees, you wouldn't need advice, but you would need wisdom. And that's where I thought advice to my son would be add wisdom. And, and that was how I constructed the poem about Peter. Yeah. That he adds I love that. wisdom. Mm -hmm. So that was the process for that mm -hmm. poem. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Good, thank you. Thank you both. Other questions from you all? Anybody? Can't see so well. Yes, Brooks. I was just curious uh, if you could talk a little bit about the poets that you read. Mm. That's a good question. Some poets that you enjoy reading. Oh. Some poets that you've enjoyed over the years, maybe. Yes. Well, I like the romantic poets. I like Wordsworth and Keats, Shelley. Mm -hmm. When I go back to read poems, I usually go, go back to them, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. The ones that first got me to love poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a teacher who taught them. A lot of times, a teacher influences, I think, people who become writers. And the, that teacher you know, had memorized some of those poems. And I was always very moved when he would recite them. And, and mm -hmm. the, yeah. I still more or less like to go back to Shelley and mm -hmm. Keith, the romantic the poets. poets. Yeah. And, you know, you've got some You've got some other students of yours in the audience. Greg Bird. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there he is. I can see Greg. Uh, Chantel Smithson, yeah. Wendy okay. Buffington. Who else? I think there are several, maybe. Uh -huh. Did I miss anybody who has actually studied under Peter? And of course, I did. And um, yeah, anybody? Yeah, but you were such an amazing uh, teacher and continue to be, Peter. Um, always generous, you know. I mean, we've all been in workshops sometimes that. Um, I don't know, they can lean toward being too critical and that can be deadly for your writing, right? It can just totally shut you down. And Peter always had such a generous eye, um, was encouraging, but still gave specific, um, you know, good advice always. So yeah, yeah. Teachers do um, make a huge difference. <laughs> I remember that you, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you did a, maybe it was a thesis on Howard Nemirov? Yes. When right. you were in college, was that right? The poet Howard Nemirov, or um, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And what was it that attracted you to his work? Do you... Well, I'm, without saying for sure what what was what I remembered is back then when I was getting interested in reading poetry, I read some by Howard Nemirov. I had no idea who he was. I didn't know I'd ever meet him, but I said, "This is good poetry. It not only sounds good." But it means something. I like that too. I didn't like <laughs> poems that don't seem to mean much, and and uh, I read all, so I you know I followed him and mm -hmm. read all his poems. I'm sure that was a great influence in, in the way I write. But mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he led me on to read, reading lots of other poems. So. Yeah, yeah, and he I know he did a lot with form, which yeah. you then experimented yeah, so with. He was interested in form, yeah. but mm -hmm. he didn't always just stay. He wrote pro. Uh, in, in prose also, but yeah. uh, mm -hmm. reverse. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but I, I, I like form. I like uh, I like reading poems that rhyme, and and I know it's it's not at all the thing that is necessary. But because I like poems that rhyme, uh, I try to write. Usually they don't all, but I try to write my poems like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that I would like myself. Yeah. <laughs> So, so those of you, many of you I know have read probably all of Peter's books, and, um, and it's true, it's like the sonnet that you just read, um, which really, until you get to the end of it, you're not even aware of it being necessarily a sonnet, and you even surprised God that way. But, but you won't know when you're reading a Peter Mikey poem um, until you get to the end of it, and you go back and you check his lines, and you suddenly say, oh my God, this is a rhyming poem, or this is actually a poem in some kind of form, because you do it so deftly. You know, it's, it's not easy to pull that off, but... Um, that's such a great surprise um, when you do that. So, Bob, how about how about you? Um, some poets that you've enjoyed reading over the well, years? Well, I read or? several. I mean, I like Sonia Sanchez. Mm -hmm. um, I like her her fire. But um, Alan Rampasan did two biographies on Langston Hughes, mm. so volume one and volume two, and. 
somebody wrote about those assessment of him that the that the assessment was better than the poet, and I didn't think so because if you write one great Hamlet worthy poem, you're a poet. There you go. <laughs> he wrote the Negro speaks of rivers. Mm -hmm. It you know it humbles me. Yeah. The grace of that poem. Mm -hmm. So I. Uh, he, he would be my most. But mm -hmm. also, James Baldwin doesn't call himself a poet, mm -hmm. but he is a poet if you read any of his novels, mm -hmm. Telling on the Mountain, or yeah. Bill Street Can Talk. So um, of all of the um, writers out there, Langston Hughes, James Baldwin, and certainly August Wilson, who started off as a poet mm -hmm. and became a playwright. And um, many years ago, I like telling this little story. I was get a phone call from, um, he was then the head of the MFA, and he said, Bob, I found you out. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, well, I was listening to NPR, and I thought I was listening to you. And it was James Baldwin. Wow. Yeah. And I paused for two or three seconds, and I just laughed. Wow. You're absolutely right. Sweet. Yes. <laughs> Wow, what a compliment. Yeah, very cool. Good. Other questions from the audience? Yes, down here. Uh, Kim, this gentleman in the front. Here. Oh, yes. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, yeah, because we are being live streamed, so it is nice to have you speak into the mic if you don't mind. Hello, live stream. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ryan. Uh, you spoke of reading works that had meaning. Um, I, I know Bobby pretty well. He uh, deals a lot with the concept of meaning. Do you feel like there was a point in your life where you had enough meaning, where you could put, you know, word to page? Were there certain, you know, pivotal paradigm shifts or experiences that that you reached where you said, okay, I can write now. I have I have the meaning. Uh, can you speak to that? Um, I think there's worth in kind of exposing some of those yeah, shifts. That's an interesting question. I, I wrote for a long time without sending anything out like, because I, I didn't have confidence in it. And I probably was right you know, when, I, <laughs> when I think about it. But, uh, I, but I, I had found poetry early on. I, my mother didn't read it particularly that I know of, but my mother liked the idea of poetry. My dad didn't read much at all except the paper, but my mother bought poetry books. I never caught her actually reading one. <laughs> but, but I read them. <laughs> and maybe she knew, I don't know if she was, we never talked about it much until I started writing. But uh, at any rate, I forget mm -hmm. what I was answering. Yeah, would you like to? Well, well, how could I answer? About the concept of meaning. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, was there a certain kind of your cup filled enough with meaning where you said, okay, well, now I can write. Now what I'm writing has the meaning you speak of. Yeah, I, I have a lot of lines I have in, in notebooks and things that sound sort of interesting and sort of poetic, but, but I don't think they mean anything. And so <laughs> I, I don't really get working on something until... Uh, it makes sense to me. And uh, and even the sense could be just because it sounds so beautiful. So mm. and I, I take that with the things I read. I, when I read a poem, I find a poem in a magazine. I don't at all require to understand the poem, but it has to both sound good to me and Makes some kind of sense that I don't. I don't have to really understand it, but it seems to tell me something. You know, mm -hmm. I need. I don't like poems that I, when I shake, I read them, and I say, I don't understand the word that that this means. You know, <laughs> I just. And maybe it's because I'm. You know, I don't have enough imagination, so I just skip on. But I like poems to at least hint at meaning, so that you will get something out of it <laughs> when uh, when you finish mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and so that. The best poems, it seems to me, is you read a poem, and oh, you say, well, that's interesting. I like it. And you like it because it sounds good, I think. Mm -hmm. 
But the best poems, so then you read it again, and the best poems eventually do mean something. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> After you give it a chance and you read it six times, something comes out. Mm -hmm. Even if you bring the meaning to yourself, yeah. who knows, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Bob, how would you answer that? Well, I um, turned 69 this August, and I've been able to listen. Mm -hmm. And so um, all of the plays that I've ever written and all of the short stories and the poems, I really never call myself a poet, but I, it has to sound like my grandmother, like my <laughs> grandfather. It has to sound in the cadence that you know, puts me on my grandfather's knee at three mm. or four mm. and five. Mm. And so mm -hmm. when it sounds right, then I know it's right. Mm -hmm. And so what I can attest to, well, similar to when I first met Peter, you listen. You listen to how the words bounce on you. Mm -hmm. And you just, and you almost without kind of a reaction, but that, you know, in the African American tradition, you could have been on a plane and you get off the plane, and your grandmother would say to you, Of course, you know, so and so has passed. Now, you wouldn't have had no, but they are always telling you, for your knowledge, this is something you need to <laughs> note. And, and so I read James Baldwin when I was going to drama school in London in 1977, and I, and I was profoundly affected by it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't start writing until the, like 89. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, you know, touched, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't have the yeah. facility to do it. So mm -hmm. listening mm -hmm. is, which is why I like, I love poetry because it really can live on the page, mm -hmm. but it really takes flight when you hear it mm -hmm. give it box. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's I like that, and and it's interesting. It is an interesting question, really. Um, and and what I would add to that, so the years before you started writing, you were sort of composting, I assume. Absolutely, and um, you right. know, mm -hmm. which I think I think many of us do, um, and even in between projects, um, you know, you're kind of doing that. But but it is interesting because you also hear people say, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to say until I started writing it. Right? We've all heard that as writers. Um, and I think that can be true also. So it's an interesting question because um, I think sometimes poets and maybe all writers are called to kind of, I don't know, trust, trust your images. Some of them are weird. Some of the ones that surface, you don't know where they're coming from. Um, but maybe we need to trust that they are surfacing for a reason and follow them a little bit, tease them out. Um, so you might not necessarily know exactly what you mean uh, before you start writing, um, but maybe you gradually come to get some meaning out of it. And I also think that can be sort of slippery. So what it means at some point when you're writing it can be very different than what it means when you go back to it later. Um, so I like, I like that question, and it's interesting. I do know from Peter's book, um, The Shapes of Poetry, which if you're looking for a great book on craft, you want to have his book for sure. Um, he talks about when he's revising a poem, you always say you don't revise toward meaning, you revise, just like you guys are talking about, you revise toward the sound of the poem. So when you go back in the poem to kind of tweak it and, and make it more what you want it to be, you're following again that ear, yeah. um, instead of just trying to poke the meaning out of the poem. So, um, yeah. Yes, yeah, the sound makes it a poem mm -hmm. rather than the meaning, yeah. yeah. Which, which also ties into what, what you always told us in class and that I think I tried to, um, pass on to my students, read your poems aloud, not just after you've written them, but while you're writing them, you know, read them aloud, feel them in your mouth. Um, yeah, Eugenie. Uh, the Fine Arts Museum brought in a friend of mine who's a curator from Buffalo, and he talks about creativity and aging. You're both too young to really think about this, but, but he looked at Miles Davis, and he looked at uh, great dancers and writers and artists, and the 
work they did as young people and the work they did later in life and where that went. And I would be interested in both of you young men sort of telling me, do you look back at writing you did years ago and see a different person? Is what you're doing now, uh, does aging play into that? And how do you feel about creativity sort of throughout life? Hmm. Wow, good questions. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a good question, but I, I, I think uh, when I started, I, to feel what you call creativity. And I always worried about that word. I didn't particularly want to be creative, but I did like poems. <laughs> and and uh, in, the, in the beginning, I was, I kept them secret. I was, I didn't, I wasn't sure at all. But I, I just was pushed to write. I some, I would wake up at night and I'd get up and write things down. And eventually, because I was a teacher, I read enough to say that, well, maybe I should I never was able to show them to anybody either. I didn't show them to my friends. <laughs> and uh, I sent them to editors. And some came back and some were taken, you know. And so slowly I, I became a, I was not at all an early beginner. I, I was a late developer in, as a poet. And eventually they, pe people started taking the poems and I just maybe got better at it, I have no idea. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, so and you're still, still writing great poems. Well, That's the answer to the aging enough. part. I'm slowing down a lot. <laughs> yeah. Bob? Well, hmm. As Peter said, so certainly when I first started writing, and I've been now writing for 30 years, I, you know, I never knew whether it was good or not, but I did know that if I spoke it out loud in some, and then until 20 years ago, I used to just write out on legal pad, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens, and then I type it out. But if it sounded, you know, delicious, then I would, I would go with that. And then if it was what I was intended, like one of the lines I wrote years ago, the character says, I don't have to walk my daddy's mile. And I thought, that's exactly what I mean. Personally, my dad was, uh, uh, you know, from the south, Louisiana, had a hard, you know, life. And so when I wrote that for this character, but then I knew that I was speaking, then so that's kind of where I know I don't judge it, but if it sounds right, and it's what I intend to say, then I go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paul, if you don't mind, can I turn your question back on you? You've got your great books, like the Florida Hustle is your latest. How would you answer your own question? Good question. I, I certainly felt everything stronger when I was younger. And the idea of writing was very strong in my head. In fact, 
in my high school yearbook, it says, you know, they want to be, probably will be, and it said, uh, you know, you want to be a sailor and you'd probably be an admiral. And mine says, Peter Meinke wants to be a writer, probably will be censored. <laughs> <laughs> That's in my high school, my high school yearbook. <laughs> but I still, I still feel the urge to write. So not, I guess not as strongly as I used to, though. I, I used to wake up in the morning, you know, because I had thought of something and I'd put away other things. Mm -hmm. And I, I would go to my class, which I was teaching English, you know, and I often had to ad lib my classes because I had been working on a <laughs> so I apologize if any of my students. Never noticed that. <laughs> um, how about Hunt? Do you have any thoughts on this? Hunt Hawkins and his wife, Elaine Smith, um, also both wonderful writers. I first met Hunt when he was one of my all-time favorite teachers in grad school at FSU and a wonderful poet. And, and Elaine is, gosh... Um, a historian, and she's in the humanities. They both taught at USF in Tampa for many years, and Elaine uh, is an Edith Wharton scholar. So how about you guys? What about your writing, and um, and do you feel, because I mean, I know, because we've been in a writing group together for many, many years, um, you, you know, you're still putting out a lot of wonderful poems. So what, how would you answer that question? How has it shifted over time? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> There's a mic. Well, this is actually something I've given a lot of inconclusive thought to. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I read uh, uh, journals now, which are, seem to be mostly edited by 23-year-olds and full of poems by 23-year-olds who are searching for identity. And I long ago gave up my search for identity. <laughs> if maybe I found an identity and just stuck with it, um, so I know I, I I feel a little bit out of sync with 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 the younger people, which bothers me. Uh, but I mostly now I'm writing about being old. And <laughs> <laughs> and, how, how various parts of myself don't work so well anymore. Uh, and and I, I don't know how interesting that is to other uh, people. The, uh, the other thing that has happened to me is that I spent uh, a long time as an academic administrator, mm -hmm. and maybe Hank has run into this problem too, where I had to write many, many memos in which I had to get rid of all ambiguity and <laughs> try, try, try to make it so it couldn't possibly be misunderstood. And that has not served me well as, mm. a, as a poet. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Because yeah. it's, it's especially, uh, I know, I was really enjoying the the, the heels turning into wings and very surreal all of that flight of fancy um, but I'm now having trouble thinking of metaphors uh, because mm -hmm. metaphors are kind of inherently ambiguous and you know you're comparing two things but you don't know exactly what the grounds of comparison are so I'm kind of hoping for the for the fountain to, <laughs> to, to start flowing uh, mm. more freely than it is at the moment. Well, Hunt, Hunt uh, won a huge award, um, the Yale Younger Poets series, um, for his wonderful book called Domestic Lives. What year was that, Hunt? That was, it was actually, it was the Agnes Sarah uh, Lynch uh, Okay, prize, that's right, yeah. Prize. Mm -hmm. the, the, the University of Pittsburgh, and I was gonna ask actually, Peter about his yeah. relationship with Ed Ochester, mm -hmm. who just uh, died uh, recently, and, and uh, but he was my editor. But that's a huge award, yeah. Yeah, he was my editor, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was, that was very nice. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> was there a question there? I forgot. Yeah. Well, thank you. Elaine, do you want to add anything from, from your own standpoint? Right? No. Okay. No. All right. There's a question, I think, right? <laughs> There's a question right there. This gentleman's been holding for a minute. Okay. So, what haven't you written about yet? Oh, wow. <laughs> What haven't you written about yet? Wow, what a what a question. Hmm. Who wants to take a step? You want to go first this time, Bob? What have you not written about yet? Well, you know, my mother and my father and my siblings and James Baldwin and then later August Wilson have the biggest thumbprint on me. And James Baldwin says that a writer writes out of one thing and one thing only, his own experience. And how you look at that experience, either good or bad, but if you can mine it and just shake it, jar the floor with it. So um, uh, there's a thread through many of the things that I've written, but um, I have many interests, so um, I could write uh, 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 Intazaki Shenge, who wrote for Colored mm -hmm. Girls, who considered mm -hmm. suicide when the rainbow is enough. She gave us this form called a choreo poem, mm -hmm. and that seems to fit the kind of focus I can put on anything. Mm -hmm. Architecture, mm -hmm. I'm very fascinated by that. Um, um, greediness. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know any specific subjects, just I am, you know, mm -hmm. for instance, the, the, the Stevie Nicks has that song called Landslide, Time Makes You Bolder, Children Get Older. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a subject, mm -hmm. and I'm well in it, so... <laughs> I hope I have the, uh, you know, the fascination with it to explore it. But I don't know about anything that I ha ha want to write about that I haven't, even directly or tangentially or in a tertiary way. But okay, how about you, Peter? Is there any subject matter that you can think of that you have, for whatever reason, decided not to write about yet, or do you just, or that you've realized that you have not yet written about that you maybe want to? Well, one thing I've always thought I could write more about, because I spent so much time with it, is sports. Mm -hmm. I've always liked sports. I'm, my wife, Jeannie, was a great athlete. <laughs> and you know we played uh, tennis, tennis and all our lives and when we could. But if she wanted, she could play basketball, too, and all that, that <laughs> kind of thing. And I, I feel that I could, I, I could perhaps have something interesting to say about about sports, but I haven't organized it well mm -hmm. enough to make it interesting enough to me. But I think some, I, I will write either a poem or an article about sports mm -hmm. and yeah. connect it to writing somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a certain you know uh, energy that sports has that I think you should have. Writers should have it too. You know, mm -hmm. there's something physical about writing that I, I often feel. I, I don't feel now. I forget, I forget how old I am. I think I'm 90 anyway. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't have that energy. I used to wake up and it was a, f I wanted to write, you know, it was actually a feeling that I had, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, uh, I'd, like that. I'd like to study that a little bit and mm -hmm. write more about it, you know. You know, a nice thing now um, is that hybrids are. Um, so welcome. So many literary journals are looking for people to be writing in hybrids. So a cross between prose poems and um, you know other types of poetry or lyric essays, which really border a lot on almost a, a prose poem. And um, it's a great time for that. So even if there's subject matter that you think you've covered, to explore it in a different way, a different uh, form is a lot of fun. And um, I think encourage a lot now. Other questions? Yes, Hank. Thanks. Um, this is more of a recollection, which I think, uh, in a way, touches on many of the questions here having to do with persistence and the rationale for doing things. Um, whether we get older or we are young and searching for how we will 
bring experience into what we do. It was in a public setting, and Bob Devon was talking about cornbread and a family recipe. And he went through the process and how the, the cornmeal was soaked and what else needed to be added. And at the end, he said, of course, you could make this same recipe without buttermilk, but why would you? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that what we hear from our writers, that adding that richness uh, to the experience, <clears throat> adding their humanity, mm -hmm. their passion for life, their love of community that is what the ingredients are that, mm. that has made this community uh, in a very substantial way what it is. So I want to thank you both. Thanks very much. Absolutely. I think that is probably the right note to, to end on. Thank you, Hank. Absolutely. And thank you so much to Peter and to Bob both for how you have um, graced our community over the years, um, all that you've done for artists of all kinds and um, the, the power of your words. Thank you. Both. And thank you for thank you. inviting oh, us thank to you. be Getting here together. All of us organized yeah. like okay. <laughs> And thanks to all of you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who are live streaming this, um, we appreciate you tuning in also. And, um, I think there's some books in the back. Uh, please go buy some. And thank you to Tombolo Books um, for selling the merchandise. All right. Hope to see you guys Goodbye. next month. <laughs>